We start right here in Chicago, where what's happening between the police, the people, and the prosecutor matter to you no matter where in America you live. Few cities have seen a crime surge like here in Chicago. Every Monday morning, the city wakes to headlines reading dozens shot and killed over the weekend. And it comes as no surprise, really, anymore. People become numb to the numbers. They barely bat an eye at those numbers. And the national media treats it like a political football. All week, we have talked about the cold-blooded killing of Chicago police officer Ella French. She was shot and killed during a traffic stop, but no one's really talking about it except people who live in Chicago or the suburbs or those who watch Fox News or this program. Tonight, I'm joined by the Cook County State's Attorney, Kim Fox, who took office four and a half years ago with a promise to rebuild public trust, something that had been lost, promote transparency, as well as lower crime. Glad to have you. We appreciate it. Thank you for having Thank me, Leland. I moved to Chicago about three months ago, and when I got here, uh, I had, was given two words of advice by a number of people, which was, be careful. Was that good advice? I, I think that's good advice wherever you are um, in America. Uh, what I would say to you as a, a long, uh, lifelong Chicagoan is welcome. Uh, this is an incredibly vibrant city, a city of incredible neighborhoods and people who are experiencing the challenges of violence in ways that are horrific. Um, and something, as you said earlier, that we should not be numb to. So you'd agree we've got a real problem on our hands? Absolutely. So here, here are the statistics that we wanted to put up. And this is uh, from when you have taken office till now, uh, as we look at it. We missed those. But homicides are up 50% from 2019 to 2020. Reasons. I mean, we're in a global pandemic unlike anything we've seen in any of our lifetimes, which led to a terrible economic downturn, uh, people being confined to their homes. And what we're seeing in Chicago is what we're seeing nationally is a year that's an anomaly. I came into office in 2016, which was an incredibly violent year in Chicago, um, the most violent we'd seen in 20 years. In 2017, 18, and 19, those violent crime numbers went down, homicides went down. We've seen this uptick as it relates to this pandemic, and certainly we are not alone. It's interesting you bring up the pandemic because in July, for example, uh, COVID deaths 69, homicides 105. So it's cre the pandemic has created an even greater problem than the pandemic itself. Absolutely. We have multiple ailments that are happening through this pandemic, the disease itself and the chronic disease of gun violence in the city. Talking about the chronic disease of gun violence, you have talked on and on about the problem of illegal guns coming in to the city of Chicago. And something that really highlights that is the shooting and killing of Ella French, 29-year-old police officer, uh, tragic in every way. Uh, and this is an interesting case because Jamal Danzi uh, is a man who allegedly purchased the illegal gun in Indiana, straw purchase is what it's called, and then either gave it or sold it to the men who we'll get to in a minute who allegedly shot and killed Officer French. He was released today on a $4,500 bail. As I understand, $4,500 he didn't even have to pay. Essentially signed his name and got out. That's federal court. Is that the problem? No, I mean, I think what people have to understand is how the bail system works. The United States Constitution enshrines in it, in the Bill of Rights, the rights for the accused to not have an excessive bail. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're a federal judge or a county judge, uh, a local judge, you have to abide by the Constitution. Right. What I read um, was that the judge said, given the fact that this man did not have a background and the nature of the offense, he was entitled to a bail um, that he could afford. And what I would say is here in Cook County, we've been working on bail reform since I got into office in 2016. Big part of your platform running, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And part of that is we knew people who were incredibly dangerous, but who had access to cash, who could get out of jail um, just by paying their, their way out, while people who were not a threat would sit in jail and languish. And so what we saw in the federal court, and again, it's not a Cook County judge who made that determination, was that this was a person who didn't have a background in the nature of the offense. He gave him a bail um, that allowed yeah. him to get out. Yeah. And, and he's out. You have to wonder sort of what message that sends to the next Jamal Danzi who might uh, want to buy a gun in Indiana and bring it into Chicago. Ella French's accused killer, though, was not out on bail. He was out on probation. Uh, Amante Morgan is his name, 21 years old. Uh, your office had charged him with robbery. 
uh, back in 2019. He was on probation. I believe we have a picture of his uh, mugshot. Uh, had you, your office demanded a harsher sentence, perhaps not taking the plea deal, he wouldn't have been out on the street. Is that a fair criticism? Not at all. I mean, I think we have to recognize that this was a, a, a horrible tragedy. And I know as we seek to is find answers... a tragedy answer, or a crime? I mean, it's, it's, this was a cold-blooded murder, right? Absolutely. And okay. it's tragic. It's tragic for her family. It's tragic for our city. It's tragic for the, I think, 10 others who were killed this weekend as well. But what we can't do is try to go back and pretend that we have a crystal ball and can see how something like this will happen. This was someone who didn't have a criminal background, who was 19 years old, I believe, at the time, and the nature of the offense um, allowed for him to be probationed, probationable. And so this was someone but who it, got a sentence the nigga, It allowed was, him to be, but is that the best policy? I mean, we don't have a crystal ball, but shouldn't we learn from our past mistakes? Absolutely. And we have a criminal justice system that has done that. And what we've seen is that people who deserve long sentences, get them. And we also see people who have a possibility for redemption get the opportunity to perform on probation. There are thousands of people who are on probation every single year. What we saw with Ella French was tragic, but for the thousands of others who are on probation who do not pick up a gun, who do not kill in cold blood, to suggest that probation is not the answer, I think is a bit short-sighted. So I guess it's a, it's a balancing act, right? Because if we had locked away Amante Morgan, Ella French would be alive today. We can all agree on that. So how, what is the proper balance? How many more murders do we have by felons who are out on probation and who have had previous records? How many do we allow on probation? How many murders do we allow before we have to really start clamping down? Well, Leland, I think the best answer I think I would give you is that anybody who's accused of any crime from misdemeanor traffic to a felony mm -hmm. should be locked up for the rest of their lives. I mean, that's the safest way to ensure that someone who has been accused doesn't get out. That balance is what I'm saying to you is that every day in courthouses, judges are looking at the facts that we bring to them and looking at their background and making a determination. And mm -hmm. thousands of others are not going out and committing the horrific sure. act that this person is alleged to have done. Fair enough. But we can also agree that Mr. Morgan is not the only one who's reoffended. And you, you came in on a policy, and we can debate the policy, whether it's good or not, of, of being more lenient, of giving people more chances on probation. If we put up the statistics in terms of what has happened in crime in Chicago once again, which we have, and the increase in murders, the increase in violent crime, the increase in carjackings, the question would be, how is this policy of more people on probation going right now? Well, I think first you have to remember I came into office in 2016. We had 763 murders in 2016. I came in in December. In 2017, we had a decrease year over year. 2018 and 2019, three years where the policy was in place and we saw a decrease in crime. What we know is our criminal justice system, not just here, but across the country, we have high levels of what we call recidivism. People who get out and find their way back into the criminal justice system within a short period of time. What we have to do is recognize kind of common sense that if that, if we keep putting people in jail and we're not giving them the resources or the opportunities to be able to not commit crimes again, we're just going through this cycle. And so I agree with you. Our policies have been focused on violent crime. My policies have said, listen, we spent a lot of time, energy, and resources after the year 2016 with all of those people murdered. Our number one referred prosecution wasn't for... That it went down uh, before this, when you when you took office, shootings have skyrocketed. We can all uh, see that. So much of your policies have been informed by how you grew up. You grew up in uh, one of the worst parts of Chicago, Caprini Green. I'm not a lifelong Chicagoan, but I remember that. I, I read a quote that really touched me in the Chicago Tribune. You said you used to use a bathtub for refuge during the gunshots right. that, that you were experiencing. What do you say to the little girls, just the young Kim Foxes right now in these very same neighborhoods who are afraid to go outside and are cowering in these same bathtubs night after night from gang violence? 
I say I see you and I feel you, but I really want to speak to the people who represent them. I was cowering in bathtubs in the 70s and the 80s. Here we are in 2021 with stubborn problems of gun violence. While those projects are gone, neighborhoods like Roseland and Little Village um, and Inglewood, the issues related to gun violence are connected to economic disinvestment, are connected to poverty, are connected to a lack of access to education and resources. If we want to be serious about the next Kim Fox, who doesn't have to survive to be able to become a lawyer and the first black woman to do this work, we'll invest in those neighborhoods and invest in the potential of that little girl by saying we have to look at criminal justice more holistically. And part of looking at criminal justice more holistically is how you look at, at the police, I guess. And I'm wondering, what did you think of the police back then, and has your view changed? Listen, I've looked at the police as people who are here to aid our communities. Um, we can look at the police and hold them with high esteem and also hold them accountable when they do wrong. It's the same thing as doctors, same thing with lawyers. And so I view police as being able to be helpers, but we also have to recognize we've had a history in this county uh, related to police misconduct. Uh, John Burge is a famous example of someone who tortured uh, black men on the South Side. Yeah, no, that there's, there's, been, there's no question that, there's, there's bad cops. I guess, I guess the, what I'm trying to get at here is why the police rank and file here seem to hate you. And I use that word advisingly, but you're yeah. nodding in, in acceptance that that's really how they, how they feel. This is the tweet, though, from the Fraternal Over Order of Police last night, uh, ex angry with you for not showing up at the yeah. bond hearing for Amante Morgan and for others. Uh, the president there, John uh, Katsanana, said it was ridiculous and inexcusable that you were not there. He was also up upset. Uh, that not a single member of the Chicago police brass attended the pr proceedings. That's John Catanzara. Yes. Yeah, who, uh, he doesn't like you very much, does he? Um, I don't think he likes anyone very much, and it might be because he's been suspended from the police force for making racist comments um, and other things that have led him to be suspended from the force. John Catanzara doesn't represent the voices of the rank and file. What I can tell you, and, and, and I don't think many people take him seriously, what I can tell you is that when I came into office, we know that we have to work with police. They're on every single case that we have. They're, on every, they're a witness in everything that we do. I need them to be credible and legitimate. You started this segment talking about the trust that we have in our communities that have been broken. That trust between law enforcement and, and community matters. We need people who trust the system to come in and testify in court. Uh, to be able to cooperate, to be able to identify someone who's harmed them. If we don't acknowledge the harm and that breach of trust, and if we don't hold people accountable, we're not going to keep communities safe. And so we work well with police. Um, yesterday, I was not at the bond hearing because I was with FBI Director Christopher Wray, as well as U.S. Attorney John Lausch, Superintendent Brown, and others addressing the issues of violence in our community. I don't get caught up in petty squabbles. Um, I want to address the issues that are confronting our community. S speaking of that, uh, Dave, Dave Brown, the superintendent, came out and he criticized the bond that was given to the straw purchaser, the alleged straw purchaser, we have that up. Uh, to say I'm extremely disappointed uh, is uh, an understatement. It is an outrage. Obviously, that's federal court, not state. I don't want to ask you to talk about that. But Superintendent Brown has basically blamed your office and some of your policies for the problems that we have in Chicago. And it's not just here, because your policies are, are ones that are coming in across the country. They're, we have them in Washington, D.C., where I moved from, in St. Louis, in Oakland. And we're starting to see police chiefs say, that the willingness to allow for plea bargains to violent criminals yeah. and to even petty shoplifters is why we are seeing this huge increase in violent crime in America. Lila, what do you have to say? I came into office in 2016. I was hiding in bathtubs in 1973. We had one of the highest murder rates in 1989 when I was a senior in high school. We have to have serious conversations about crime and violence. I get the sensationalizing. I get the need to want to be able to point and assess blame. We know what causes violence. It's not policies that are addressing low-level nonviolent offenses. It is about the root causes. And until we have an honest conversation about that, the blame game where people right. in those neighborhoods, the little Kim Foxes who want us to be able to solve for this, they're not here for right, that. But in the, in the meantime, we've got a lot of people being murdered while we're trying to deal with the root causes. Uh, agree. And what I'm telling you is we should be really ashamed of ourselves as a country that if in 1990 we had 800 people murdered in the city of Chicago 
And last year, we had almost 800 people killed. In that 30-year span, we haven't addressed the root causes. What we need to do is really have honest conversations about what this is. I just came into office. And again, in those first three years, violent crime went down. And I know we don't like to talk about that because it dispels the narrative that somehow it is related to one individual elected official. We have a violent crime problem so, across the country. For sure. But if we're going to be honest about addressing, we right. have to but, get but, beyond but across the Across the country, police chiefs are all saying policies and talking points like the ones you're just yeah. using right now are the problem. And people in communities who are impacted by law enforcement decisions are saying that there's something wrong with the system. And what I'm saying but to you... I guess what I'm saying, can't both be true? Can't we absolutely. say we need to address the root causes, but in the meantime, we need to be more aggressive about locking up low-level of offenders? I think we need to be aggressive about locking up people who pull triggers. We have been really good over the years of arresting people for low-level nonviolent offenses where we haven't done a good job. And this is an, a, 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 a slight to our officers who run towards the danger, who do what Ella French did, who show up in situations where others don't. But our homicide clearance rate, not just here in the city of Chicago, but across the country, particularly in black neighborhoods, are abysmal. If the fact of the matter is, out of 100 shootings, right. we only arrest less than 20, that's a problem. Hey, but the statistics I show see that at least you, compared to your predecessor, are dropping a lot more homicide cases than she did. We drop cases in which the evidence isn't there. What you so also is that, a, is that a police problem? Well, whose fault is that? Well, we have a problem in Cook County in which we were called the false confession capital of the United States. We've exonerated more people for homicides in the city of Chicago based on false confessions and evidence that didn't support it. And so as a law enforcement official, I cannot proceed on the case where the evidence doesn't support it. So where you've seen that we've dropped cases, it's because the evidence doesn't support a conviction. We have spent, in the city of Chicago alone, almost a half billion dollars on police misconduct. Half billion dollars Big in the settlements. past 10 years. It's a lot of money. And so for me as a prosecutor, I'm not going to proceed on a case where the evidence doesn't support it. Right. I can't speak to why my predecessor didn't feel comfortable doing it, but that's why I do it. Great way to end it. Thank you very much. You're welcome back anytime. Of course. Awesome Thank conversation. you. Thank you.